Welcome to the Naturally Nourished Podcast that delivers cutting-edge food as medicine solutions for optimal health. Allie Miller is a nutrition expert sought up by the media and America's top medical institutes for her revolutionary functional medicine interventions. From disease treatment to prevention, every episode will empower you with ways to put yourself back in control of your health. Please note, the topics discussed are for educational purposes only. Now welcome, Integrative Dietitians Allie Miller and her co-host Becky Yu. Welcome to episode 344 of the Naturally Nourished Podcast. You are joining us for Are Your Habits Toxic, where we will be covering some common trends and habits that might be doing you more harm than good. So we'll be talking about vaping and e-cigarettes, chocolate, gel and shellac nails, false eyelashes, earbuds, and wearables. Not to burst anyone's bubble, but we'll be covering really the dirty truth about all of these things and whether you need to completely stop, find an alternative, um, things that can be done to mitigate. Maybe if a family member has one of these habits and you can't quite get them to (laughs) agree to quit. Um, and some less toxic alternatives where they apply. Yes, I feel like this has been a long time coming. Becky and I are often addressing one of these areas of focus with clients or I'm responding to DMs on social media about, you know, good, better, best opportunities. I know chocolate was a big buzz that came out earlier this year and we got some good feedback on a social post we put out there. So we'll be digging into, of course, lead and metal toxicity And I'm always trying to reiterate getting away from wearables. So I'm super excited to talk about that. We're also long overdue for an entire episode on EMF. Yes. But that'll be coming in the next coming months. But this will be just a little bit of a taste of some of the impact of, you know, watching your own electronic magnetic field and really considering the influence of losing the sovereignty of your autonomic nervous system to an external AI device, which is pretty creepy and kind of deep. I had to add that in there. You were talking more nerdy science EMF, but I had to talk about the like sovereignty of the vibration of your body. I think that's probably a good thing to talk about yes. as a, a former um, Fitbit wearer. And yes. I looked around the other day at the gym and I'm like, all these girls have an Apple watch on. That's interesting. Yeah, right? it is really wild. Yeah. So we'll get into all of it today. It's going to be a great conversation as always, not a convo to shame, but one to empower and maybe just raise an eyebrow and think through frequency of use of these types of things, or, you know, as always good, better, best, or where you're going to make your trade-offs. It's not about perfection, but it's about progress towards the best form of wellness that you can attain in your body. So before we get into today's episode, just a little bit of updates that we have going on here. We just completed our 10 day real food detox, which we ran two live classes on May 3rd and May 10th. So some of you listening might be ending up on your detox. We will uh, be pushing out a archive of that as an opportunity. And we have an evergreen archive program, which is a deeper dive virtual learning class. Um, and that's always an opportunity for you. And yes, if you're doing some of these toxic habits, detox may absolutely be a strong recommendation or consideration. So you can check that out at AllieMillerRD.com. And then updates on our wellness in Wimberley. We have now sold through our available two-day passes, but we have a couple one-day passes. And I've heard from some of you that maybe you have a work commitment on Saturday or a child's soccer game on Sunday. So we will have a one-day pass available just for this week. If you're listening live, you have the opportunity to snag either a Saturday pass or a Sunday pass. Each of the one-day passes is going to be sold at $200. Each will have a four course food as medicine menu included on the Saturday. It's more deep dive functional medicine. Uh, I will be lecturing for an hour. We'll be doing breakout sessions of making real food flavorful, talking about fat, acid, salt, sweet, how those come into combination. And you'll be able to be using tasting spoons and kind of figure out how to adjust these different levers to make food taste amazing and also enhance antioxidants 
and uh, really boost nutrient density in your dishes. Then we'll be doing a live podcast on Saturday where you can ask us anything. For you podcast nerds, such a cool opportunity to get up on the microphone, hear your own voice and share it with your circle of like, hey, I was featured on the Naturally Nourished podcast. So we'd love to meet you, uh, you know, see you in person, say hello, and also get you networked with like-minded community. And then on Sunday, if you elect to do that, that is our interactive cooking class. So this will be uh, Becky and I in the kitchen more formally for about three hours teaching a cooking class. And then we'll all sit down in a long kind of standing in the field type table situation where we will dine and ex- experience that four course meal, uh, making my uh, lion's mane leek bone broth based soup and troubleshooting bone broth. We are going to be making a spring salad with lovely bright colors from seasonal produce that's grown just up the hill in Wimberley, topped with gremolata. And then we will be doing my turmeric coconut bone in skin on chicken thighs and talking about how to do a pan sauce reduction and topping things off with a, is it a lime? Did we go with a lime lime curd kind of tart? Yeah. 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 Uh, Low carb lime tart, which is going to be just delightful. So we hope you can join us. If you couldn't do the two day pass, go on and grab either a pass for Saturday or Sunday. Last call to join us for wellness in Wimberley. This is our only in-person event for the year. So you don't want to miss it. Yes. All right. Cannot wait to see you guys there. And that link lives under the events tab, which we recently added to our website. So again, this is the only live event um, in person. We'll always under that events tab though, also have whatever like live class offering if there is one going on. So whether it's, you know, a webinar or the detox class when it's live. So head on over to events that's where you'll find it. Grab your one day pass. So before we get into today's topic on toxic habits, let's talk about a non-toxic habit that we both for sure have. In fact, we are both sipping on fond bone broth as we speak, both of us recovering from whatever that viral laryngitis situation that we had um, that you may have heard our voice is a little rough. A yes. couple of episodes back, one of my clients emailed and she's like, you sound terrible. I'm like, thank you. Thank you very much. And I think I was fine then, but this is yep. me just coming off yep. of a 48 hour vocal rest. Well, that was on Monday, Tuesday. We're recording on Friday. So yep. I, I feel a little bit less sultry than I did over the last weekend. Yes. But we absolutely love Fond. As y'all know, we actually got to hang out with Lisa, the founder of Fond Bone Broth, this past weekend at Rome Ranch at their um, Regenerative Agriculture Conference. What good shall I do? So much fun. Um, I got to talk to her about their new product, which is a regenerative beef and chicken variety that has no additives other than just the bones and salt. So this would be a fabulous option for anyone who has food sensitivities. Maybe they're doing our MRT protocol and they can't have like onion or garlic or carrot or, you know, one of the herbal additives um, that is used in Fond, which normally we absolutely love, um, but fabulous for like AIP and carnivores, I think out there as well as just a good like entry point into Fawn's bone broth. And then maybe we'll get them over to the other side of like enjoying some of the amazing flavor profiles. Elixirs, if you yes. will. And you know, the plain flavors would be great add in for bone broth based smoothies or bone broth popsicles. If again, you just kind of want a more plain Jane base, but what's not plain about Fond is of course their integrity of their sourcing of ingredients. And so they are actually now using regenerative proven bones. So, you know, this is either grass fed beef bone or pasture raised chicken bone. And these are from sources that are doing the right thing, sequestering carbon and of course, pasturing those animals. And so you can feel really good when you're purchasing their broth, that it's the most quality source. And then they use artisanal well water, which is tested daily for excellence as far as minerals and no toxicity. And I know that that's another consideration. We talked a couple episodes ago about us putting out our own collagen brand, our pure collagen, which is tested for toxic metals. That's also something you want to consider when you're looking at bone broth. So another reason why I vote with my dollar and select Fond. 
Yes, absolutely. And and if you are getting into more of the flavorful varieties, um, every ingredient is going to be handpicked and paired to optimize both flavor and nutrient density. So for example, their turmeric and cracked black pepper, that is going to aid in the utilization of, of the curcuminoids and the bioavailability there. We absolutely love their spring clean variety, which is the lemon radish, kind of lighter, brighter. I think of it as like a springy bone broth the youth tonic, which is shiitake, sage, and shallot, and the conductor, which is a more kind of warming vibe with the butternut, chipotle, and rosemary in it. And none of these are going to carry with them, you know, any carbohydrate. It's just that they're using it in the infusion and then it's being strained uh, very thoroughly. So still very keto friendly, still friendly if we're doing a bone broth fast or a protein fast in the morning. We love Fund for all of the reasons. So go and get you some. Yeah, we've actually been incorporating the Nopalitos flavor in my refried black beans that I do at my Naturally Nourished Market. Um, and I've talked about that on the podcast, just blending like a half of a jar of the Nopalitos. So it, that's cactus um, infused broth, which also has habanero and cilantro. So lovely with organic black beans and a couple cloves of garlic and then some fresh cilantro. Pour that all in a pan, bake it. Um, really great for like summer carnitas or to put under fried eggs. Lovely, lovely. It's really like your sous chef in a jar. You can elevate your flavor profiles with Fond Bone Broth. So go on over to fondbonebroth.com backslash Allie Miller RD and use the code naturally nourished, letting them know that you heard about us from the Naturally Nourished podcast. Yes. And I want to call out that's a new code that we don't usually use. So we switched it up for podcast listeners. So go on over and use it. Even if you had used the Allie Miller code before, you can use the Naturally Nourished code now. I think you'll be able to save kind of again, because yes. I think you only get yep. that first time saving. Yep. So little yep. hack for you. Little, little hack because we love you guys. Okay. So we talk about detox on here quite often. So we'll refer you, for you guys back to our most recent kind of deep dive episode on detox principles, which was just a couple episodes ago, 342. That's kind of a good entry point into today's episode where we're just going to kind of cherry pick these individual habits, if you will. Um, so we're living in a dirty world. And then, you know, there are certainly choices that we make on a daily basis that can either contribute to our toxic burden or can support wellness and detox. Um, Let's start with this one, which is a pretty obvious no-no, I think, in our book, but we got to cover it because it's so, so common right now. Vaping. Yes. So vaping, it's interesting. I just read something about comparing uh, vaping to being adult pacifiers, and it's interesting. It's true. I call my stainless steel water bottle my my adult security blanket. (laughs) That's a better, so, less toxic. You know, like I, I really do where I'm like, oh, like if I'm at a restaurant, I'm always bringing my own water because I don't want to drink municipal water uh, treated with chlorine and fluoride, et cetera. Um, and so I'm always bringing my own water bottle and I feel like naked if I don't have it. But I do think that, and, and that's not truly an addiction, but just kind of an interesting, you know, scenario there. But I do think that when we're looking at like vapes and I watch people out in public, it's the, like the way they like, my precious, like grasp it or always have it in their hand um, or like communicate with it within their hand or they're constantly sucking on it. It kind of feels like an adult pacifier. So we have to think about anytime we're selecting a, you know, habit, what is kind of the root cause? Like, is that used as a tool for social anxiety? Is that used as a stimulant? And the reality is, you know, we know that nicotine itself is highly addictive and stimulating. The problem with vapes, um, before we even get into the chemical additives of them, is that they're way more addictive. They actually have higher percent concentration of nicotine than cigarettes. And they're more difficult to quit than tobacco because also they're a lot easier to sneak. Sure. So you listeners with teenagers, I mean, they can be vaping in their bedroom for all you know, whereas they could definitely not get away with smoking a cigarette with their window open. Right. And like smoking a cigarette, I think, and I'm sure we'll talk more about this, but like takes the conscious effort of like, you have to take the time, go outside. Yes have a lighter on you or bum a light from somebody, right? I'm not talking from experience in college, I promise. Um, But you've got to, you know, set out like 10, 15 minutes, probably, I think, to smoke that cigarette. You come back smelling like smoke, like you've made that intentional 
decision. Right. Um, whereas the vape can be so passive, like you can be doing it, you know, at your desk if you have your own right. office or if you're working from home, you could be hitting that thing all day long. Mm-hmm. You could be doing it in your bedroom where you would never light a cigarette, you know, in the bedroom. You could be doing it, you know, in a bathroom at a restaurant, hopefully not at the table, but it's like right. so much easier. Yeah. So, I mean, e-cigarette users can get more nicotine. They're sold in percent concentration of, of nicotine and they can get higher concentration than you would in a combustible tobacco product, which would be a cigarette or um, even a cigar. Again, because cigar frequency is generally so low and cigar inhalation is a little bit different than we would see with like a vape. Um, We've seen in research that nicotine though in general can be as addictive as heroin and cocaine. Um, So quite highly influential on the brain chemistry. In fact, when nicotine enters the bloodstream quickly, it creates a giant dopamine spike. And that's actually been compared to the brainwave shift in dopamine when hitting crack. Um, So pretty wild. And especially when users are buying these extra strength cartridges, they're going to have, again, this higher concentration. And that whole dance with dopamine is you always chase that high or that fix. And so you're going to need to inhale it more frequently, deeper, et cetera, to try to get back to that dopamine high that you maybe were able to achieve at a lower or less frequent use. Sure. So you can kind of like ramp up your, your dosage. And I know that you can add like other flavors, which I wonder if that, um, also contributes to the addictive nature, just like you can have a key lime flavored vape for all yeah. I know. There's all kinds of things out there. Well, the flavors, strawberry vape. And the flavors definitely come into adding into the toxicity totally. for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we worry about a lot of the carriers in these products. And so there's vitamin E acetate. And, and this is added actually more to like the THC or CBD vaping products in the marijuana world. Um, which of itself can be really scary again, because highly concentrated, like there are cartridges that are 90% THC or more. Whereas, you know, back in the day, actual like cannabis flower would have like max 12%. Now we're seeing hybridization and growing operations where they're able to get it to like twenties to thirties, but the whole plant can never achieve beyond that ratio. But these concentrates Mm, can get into the 90 plus percentile. And that's where you can have quite a psychotropic response, which could impair driving, could of course create a dynamic nervous system response, panic attack, dynamic anxiety or mood changes, and could have a huge influence, very different to, again, that like old school marijuana use. And so in both senses, vaping is going to be providing a high concentration. And then the consideration is the carrier in these liquids of themselves have a lot of toxic elements that can be very disruptive to respiratory function. Um, We can see injury to lungs and airways, wheezing, shortness of breath, chronic bronchitis-like symptoms. Um, And we know that a lot of these chemicals um, can provide um, higher amounts of pesticides and that the flavorants can have toxic effects beyond that. So we're looking at things like propylene glycol, vegetable glycerin. Um, We're looking at um, other additives that can be very harmful. And these are entering the bloodstream very rapidly as an inhalant. So beyond lung injury, there's a not a lot of other even vascular issues of concern. Totally. And, and, you know, just thinking about like the toxic, toxic additives alone, like what is that doing entering right into your lungs versus like if you were eating it, you would at least have like digestive juices to battle right. it and kind Crossing of the, gut blood the barrier process, but it's going direct into the lungs. Yes. Um, so lung injury for sure. We've seen like significant reports of that. Um, we also see um, in a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine that e-cigarette use um, significantly reduces nitric oxide levels in the body, which can lead to cardiovascular issues, heart disease, stroke, all of the things, and having a really you know damaging impact on our vascular and endothelial function. Yes. I mean, the name of the game of anti-aging is upping your nitric oxide. And so, you know, we look at like the Zach Bush movements that we do in our dance class. We talked a lot during pandemic about the importance of nitric oxide boost to support oxygenation to the brain and whole body. So something that's disrupting endothelial function is not going to be a good selection. And then we've also seen impacts with research on links to depression. 
Yes. So one study that was published in the journal Addictive Behaviors, this was back in 2017, which I feel like vaping has only picked up yeah. you know, since then, um, but found a significant association between e-cigarette use and higher levels of depression compared to mm-hmm. non-users. And then another study in the Journal of Adolescent Health in 2018 found a link between e-cig use and depressive symptoms. So, you know, in all populations and then especially in the adolescent population. Um, and I have a feeling that only intensified and worsened through pandemic, right? No doubt. And again, so it's like, again, going back to that adult pacifier, <laughs> there is this coping mechanism where we're not addressing the root cause of mental health. And then we're seeking externally something to give that pickup or that surge or that boost um, that nicotine provides as a stimulant. Um, so definitely something that we would say is an absolute no-go on vaping and a stronger word of caution again, especially in some of the THC or CBD vapes, which are often added with more of that vitamin E acetate to thicken and make more of like a tar-like substance, um, really strong considerations to make sure that we're able to stop. Um, but let's talk a little bit about how we can mitigate the effects as we're working on wean or quitting. Yes. Um, And with it being more addictive and easier again to sneak, I think it's one of those things like it probably needs to be a cold turkey. Like, I don't know if we wean off of it or how it works, but needs to be like out of the space, out of the house. Mm -hmm. Um, Vitamin C is one that comes to mind. So we know that, you know, toxicity in general is going to deplete antioxidants, but in particular, vitamin C and glutathione are going to take a big hit. Yep. Um, and this has been, you know, well studied back in the day when we were just smoking cigarettes, not just these right. crazy vape things. Right. Um, so our bio C plus would be a high recommendation and I'd get going on like two to three, maybe upwards of even four per day. If you or someone that is in your household is using these e-cigarettes just to replete that antioxidant alone. Yeah. I mean, we've seen, like you said, for decades now, recommendations for higher vitamin C dosage for tobacco users Mm -hmm. because of that oxidative stress. Um, So bio C plus would be a huge necessary supplement tool. And then when you're speaking to glutathione, that would be our cellular antiox. And I would say cellular antiox, even maybe more so in the world of function when we're talking about respiratory health, because we've seen that glutathione can actually protect our bronchioles. Um, We've seen that our respiratory function can be enhanced as we see glutathione stores increasing. So getting that NAC or N-acetylcysteine, cysteine is a great detoxifier for heavy metals as well as uh, metabolites of toxins. So these additives would be supported in some sense with that N-acetylcysteine. And then that glutathione as that master antioxidant protecting the actual respiratory tissue. And then, you know, even beyond that, I think once we've quit or if we're working on on weaning down or maybe not even ready to quit yet, um, doing the detox packs as a tool and or completing a 10 day detox, like when you Mm -hmm. stop vaping and then probably doing that quarterly just because of, again, all of the unknown of all of those toxic additives. We really want to replete, flood you with antioxidants and support your body in excretion of who knows how long those chemicals would last in the body otherwise. Yeah. And I think that like when you were mentioning Becky, you know, having a difficult, like what is a wean, what is a hard stop? I think that probably the best option, if it's like a husband or it's yourself as you're listening to this, and that's like your one secret habit is probably using a cleaner source of nicotine as you're weaning, but, but stopping the vaping hardcore, you know? So I haven't researched leading into this episode to speak intelligently on this, but I do know that there's a bunch of different nicotine sprays or droppers um, and then also like patches. All of them will come with their own insult, but likely less than the impact of the vaping itself as far as destructive to the lung respiratory tissue. Um, And again, less of that like pleasure pacifying. So you're actually getting some of that chemical dependency addressed on a wean, um, but then you're not going to create as destructive or maybe as addictive of a pattern. Yep. And those patches and gums at least have been around, you know, and stood the test of time at least, you know, since people have been trying to quit cigarettes. And then if we're looking biochemically on a actual natural way to support nicotine dependency, I think of nicotinamide or niacin, right? And so when we look at niacin or B3, um, this is a nutrient which would actually ramp up NAD and that mitochondrial boost for energy production. 
but also can help on a receptor function with nicotine dependency. And so our B complex would be something great to layer in, which would have a pretty potent amount. And then you might even bring in like a flushing niacin and incorporate that with your detox as well. And that's going to support more the vasodilation and that nitric nitric oxide oxide production, right? To kind of undo that impact. Um, So I think that would for sure be a favorable recommendation. And then as far as addictive elements, Becky, let's talk about um, tools uh, as far as supplementation to maybe um, actually aid more as a favorable tool for anxiety, mood, and social, especially social anxiety and and that addictive uh, kind of impulse control. Totally. So I would think of use of bioidentical GABA as kind of the first tool there, Um, especially if you do find that the vape is coming in in you know, higher amounts in the times of like social anxiety or we're under, you know, a big deadline at work and we're looking for, you know, a little bit of escapism, if you will, um, use of the GABA calm and probably going like with a pretty hefty dose of like one to two, you know, three times daily as we are trying to quit. Because I also know that there can be significant mood disturbance and just irritability, I think. Um, and if that's, you know, your husband in the household, that's something nobody wants to deal with. So I think, you know, one to two GABACOM three times daily would be a good recommendation. That's going to aid in the impulse control piece of the puzzle too. And then I always recommend with my clients who are dealing with addictive, you know, food cravings to take that and find a way to distract yourself for like 10 or 15 minutes while it has time to kick in so that you're not just sitting there, you know, white knuckling. I know I have an extra vape cartridge in my car or some secret one hidden somewhere or whatever. Um, But taking yourself on a walk, making a cup of tea, calling a friend or, you know, I don't know, watching a funny YouTube video while it kicks in just to kind of replace that habit. Absolutely. All right. Let's move on to chocolate. Yeah. 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 So we posted this. Um, I was looking back at our post last night and I did it just post Valentine's Day because I didn't want to like completely break <laughs> anyone's heart. Um, but Consumer Reports um, recently put out um, a an article where they tested 28 different brands of dark chocolate. Um, and all of them across the board. And this wasn't just like the crappy, you know, chocolates off the grocery store shelf, but some of our favorite brands, unfortunately, um, all of them were found to have some level of lead and cadmium. So toxic metals. And then 23 of the brands had higher than acceptable levels of at least one. So either lead or cadmium or both. Now, I will say, you know, heavy metals are going to be naturally present in the soil and they mm-hmm. can accumulate in plants, um, which includes cocoa plants. But I bet if we did this level of rigor of testing, even on like carrots or lettuce yeah. or sweet potatoes grown in certain regions, we'd come back with some scary facts there as well. And I think that was a big scare recently with like the baby, the jarred organic baby food. I don't know if you caught all of that, but they were talking about, oh, there's lead in it. And I'm like, it's probably because there's lead in the produce. It's not actually the manufacturing process, right? Maybe, yeah. And and I think the thing to note is like, again, the region where it's grown. Mm -hmm. Um, And so cacao is grown in a lot of third world countries. Right. So that's why there's a big emphasis, you know, even before we looked at really organic fair trade was like the big thing with cacao sourcing because a lot of like, there was like chocolate slavery work going on. Um, and so when we're looking at metal toxicity in the soils of third world countries, there's a lot going on there. And that's definitely an area of, of focus. And so when I looked at this, I said kind of, you know, okay, my, my first perspective was pause, think critically, right? Not irrationally. And think about maybe this is just the first time that someone has actually tested this volume of amount of chocolate brands. And this has likely been in the chocolate mm-hmm. for a very long time. It definitely since industrialization in our world, right? Um, and so when we're looking at this, we have to consider, and my, my other peace of mind was like, okay, well, that is why I take cellular antiox every day <laughs> because I'm getting that knack and that glutathione. So we're getting a repeat supplement from vaping and chocolate. Um, but you know, that was kind of my little touche to clients that I've been speaking to or people that would come into the market and say, well, okay, so you're selling dripping Springs chocolate. 
is the Dripping Springs chocolate. Um, that's a little town outside of my area in Hill Country. Is that free of lead? Is that free of toxic metals? And I said, well, you know, it's such a small company. They're not going to likely afford third-party testing for their right. metals. So we can say, yeah, it's quote unquote free of it or hasn't been tested to have this. But it's sourced from Ecuador. It's right. sourced from Africa. Right. It's We're not growing from... chocolate in Dripping Springs. Right. <laughs> so, you know, when we really look at this, the higher percent cacao is likely going to have the the higher percent accompanying metals. And that's what was kind of, I think, especially disturbing in the consumer reports. Things like Hershey bars, which have like the TBHQ uh, preservatives mm-hmm. and soy lecithin and gunky additives, which have their own gamut of health destructive influence, were showing maybe less metal toxicity right. than something like Theo's or Hue. And, you know, the the real thing to think critically of this is we're talking about percent concentration of cacao, right? (laughs) So it's not like these quality high cacao brands are sourcing, quote unquote, dirty chocolate. The fact of the matter is chocolate is dirty. The higher percent cacao is likely going to have more of that residue. But what it also has higher amounts of is theobromine. What it also has higher amounts of is antioxidants. What it also has higher amounts of is good minerals for your body. So I think that there's this, again, knowing this to nature, knowing this to God, that there's going to be something that will offset that kind of hormetic stressor or demand. And, you know, the closer we get to that whole plant, I still vote that there's more health supporting compounds than health depleting. And I have no problem eating hundred percent cacao nibs. Um, I try to source fair trade and organic where possible, but I also make sure that I'm mindful about supplementing with cellular antiox daily. Totally. And, and like you said, the antioxidants in the chocolate alone may offset some of this risk. We don't know that hasn't been, you know, studied in, in this capacity. Um, I think the other, you know, piece of, of good news here is we're not eating like entire chocolate bars, yes. you know, daily. Hopefully. This is more of a mindful indulgence versus a daily staple or even if it is a daily staple you know we've talked for years now about doing like one to two squares of dark chocolate paired with nut butter or something like that as kind of an after meal little treat Um, it's not the foundation of your diet right yeah, absolutely. I yep. think that that should be in that like mindful indulgence versus necessity. Um, absolutely. And it might have you be mindful about maybe if you were doing like a cacao powder in your smoothie daily, um, maybe you rotate and do some green smoothies. So I think variety is key always. Sure. And, you know, same thing when you're doing a cacao smoothie versus a green smoothie, maybe you're getting lower oxalate on that day. Right. right. So variety is key. The dose is what um, depends on the level of the poison. And And um, this is one where I'm going to give it a still mindful indulgence stamp of approval. Totally. And there are certain brands like the Mast, I know, was lower Mm -hmm. um, in heavy metals. Mast and um, the other one was... I have it on here somewhere. Uh, I know Theo's and who, like you said, tested a little bit higher. Taza. It was Mast and Taza. And those are also going to be brands free of soy less than. Yeah. Um, so we also don't want you guys to go and read the consumer reports and be like, yeah, Hershey's <laughs> check. Right. Or go to milk chocolate because that's going to be, you know, lower um, antioxidant, more sugar. Um, and I think the other good news is, you know, that these companies are, are, seeing this report come out, it's going to hit their bottom line and likely they're going to do whatever is in their power. Um, if there is anything that they can do about, you know, reducing those levels, doing some third party, um, testing and, and trying to make their brands safer for the consumer. Yes. Okay. Um, so all about balance chocolate still gets a go. Um, let's next talk about some of the cosmetic trends out there, um, starting with nails. Um, so let's talk gel, shellac, acrylic. Um, I know you and I don't typically do <laughs> that kind of thing, um, but do or don't. I know. I'm, I'm really just working to use a nail brush to just not have dirt behind my nails. That's the, <laughs> that's the best that I get as far as grooming and... <laughs> or Steli might paint your nails. Yeah. Yeah. But actually Maddie and BB have kind of retired from that, that phase of our journey. We, I took Stella, well, she, so our little, uh, like names, she names me Maddie and she's BB and we're like little besties when we play pretend. 
And so last year, I forget if I shared this on the podcast, but last year, Maddie and BB went to the salon um, and there's like, you know, one or two in my small town. And so we went one time and the first time was a success when we got our toes done. And except for like the guy kind of yelled at her a little bit. He was like, and he wanted her to like put gels on her toes. And I was like, absolutely not. Um, He's like, they're going to get messed up. I'm like, she's, she's six. It doesn't matter. You know, I'm still going to pay you. It's fine. Um, And she was giggling and kind of liked some of like the toe, you know, uh, buffing and things like that, uh, but didn't want our toenails trimmed. It was kind of a little bit hesitant. But then when we did our fingernails, she went, I brought my mom that time and she went last and she was just like, we had to wait so long. It was so stinky in there. Mm-hmm. I don't think Maddie and BB need to go back. Um, so I do have, I saw in the notes and we'll, we'll link the piggy polish, which yeah, Becky, piggy pa- Aunt Becky got is. for yeah. us. Yes. Um, and so we do have that, but now it's like the frequency of use is like maybe three times a year. Um, because she just got kind of turned off with the whole process. And it's so funny because I'm always like, whose daughter is she? She also likes to wear tights. And I remember that I would like fight my mom every week for ballet of like, ah, get them off. Um, so Stella's definitely more feminine more in her accessories, characteristics. dresses, tights, headbands, all of the things. Yes, totally. <laughs> so let's talk. And I had, a, I had a phase to be clear listeners of shellac or gels. I, I don't honestly really know the difference. Maybe you can enlighten me, Becky, but um, and then there's the dip. I don't, I don't know, but I had a little phase when I probably from 2014 to 2015 until I got pregnant, um, where I was getting them done regularly. And I can't, and that was when I was doing TV segments yeah. because again, I'm not maybe always the best about making sure my nails are clean. And I had like one TV segment where they showed me picking up a food and you saw dirt in my nails. And I was like, Oh no, never again. Um, and so I did do that for about maybe a total of like 10 runs in a row. And I will say just personally, I'm also a picker. And so I would of course peel off the gel. Mm -hmm. Um, and that would definitely destroy my nail bed. Um, and so, you know, we talk a little bit about how they can make brittle nails, but really like I was removing for certain, you can't tell me I wasn't a layer of my nail. Oh yeah. Um, so like, or more than a layer of my nail and they would get really peely and thin and lost their strength. Um, and even if you're doing a soak, you know, we really want to make sure that's a hundred percent acetate that they're right. generally using. Right. So a volatile compound, both to stress our respiratory system, um, but also that volatile compound to actually break down on the chemical that's added. And that does and wear away like at your nail skin. Scrape it. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I can't tell you how many clients when I'm doing their intake, you know, I ask about hair, skin, and nails, those kind of cardinal yes. signs of, of wellness. And we often see with the nails, you know, nutrient deficiency, that's one of the first place that yes. B vitamin deficiency might present, or maybe we're not getting, you know, enough protein and our nails are really brittle. But I have so many clients who are like, well, I wear gel all the time, so I don't know. Or yeah, "Yeah, my nails are brittle because of that. And I'm like, okay, like that's a double hit for like, we need to do a detox because of the toxicity element. But I also want you to start some collagen so that your nails can recover and grow back, right? Yeah, that's a huge point. So our pure collagen would be, we'll go into a little bit more nitty gritty, but just since you brought it up. Our pure collagen would be a really good antidote in some sense, um, or at least mitigate the effect because in our collagen, the way that we extract it in our particular enzymatic process allows for a small peptide called Verisol. Um, and so we have Forta gel, Forta bone, and Verisol in our pure collagen. And this cannot be said about just general collagen peptides. You're usually getting them bound. And so these active compounds are not accessible on a level for the body to be able to use. But the Verisol has been shown in research to improve hair, skin, and nail health. So we've seen actually reduction in cellulite. We've seen thicker and stronger hair follicle, and we've seen improvements in nail health. Um, and so that would be something that absolutely would be a strong recommendation. Let's talk a little bit, Becky, though, before we yes. get into things to mitigate as far as research and other yuck stuff and considerations. Yes. Um, so gel nail polish and, and the gel shellac thing, I think they're pretty close in terms of like their, you know, composition and the way that they cure it, um, which is with a UV light. Um, the dip I've never personally done, but again, all of these are going to have some form of toxic elements or additives. Um, So we're looking at methyl acrylate, acrylates, 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 Um, and acrylates, which can cause um, 
skin irritation, hives, contact dermatitis, um, and has even been um, called a you know carcinogen, which means that it's known to cause cancer. So that is extremely problematic in and of itself. Um, and then beyond just what we're putting on the nails, the chemical exposure, and like you mentioned, even the like low toxic nail salons, I still feel like they smell when you mm-hmm. go in there or mm-hmm. the quote unquote organic manicures. I don't think anybody no. is regulating that. So I don't know what that means. I know I went to a place in Austin that's like called organic nail spa <laughs> and I'm like, this smells worse than, yeah. you know, the, the other places. Um, but beyond what we're putting on our nails, the UV exposure yes. is also, um, a concerning element. Um, so we talk about, you know, sun exposure, good likely, but not constant chronic. Um, and especially the skin of our hands. I feel like that's an area that gets a lot of premature aging and age spots anyway. Yeah. And risk factor for melanoma, you know, this is where we definitely would want to watch out for cancer risk factor. So you're being exposed to carcinogens in the product and then you're accelerating that through the intensive rays of the UV. Definitely something I would say not ideal. Um, there are some places that use led lights instead. Um, and you know, use cleaner again, quote unquote, more organic polishes. So that would be one way to kind of reduce the impact of toxicity. Um, and so this would be something to consider and look for in your region. Um, if you wanted to get that longer lasting polish, do they have an led option? Yes, totally. Um, and, um, there are polishes now that are more on the natural side. They're at least like free of formaldehyde, um, that also are considered like longer wearing, right. Um, but maybe aren't the gel or shellac. Um, so I would consider looking into some of the brands like the piggy paint. That's more Mm -hmm. of like a kid, I think friendly. Um, It doesn't really stay on very long, (laughs) but free of formaldehyde, toluene, um, ethyl acetate, acetone, some of those concerning ingredients. There's also Zoya, um, there's Butter London, there's Ella and Mila, which is also more of like a kid friendly. It's got a cute little elephant. I know you guys Aww. have some because uh-huh. I've given her some. Okay. <laughs> um, and then um, Pacifica brand, which is going to be free of that formaldehyde. So that's a big thing that we're looking at as, you know, another highly toxic chemical is formaldehyde as an additive in most of these nail polishes. Yeah. And then these individuals, because of the carcinogens, I would highly recommend the bio C plus sure. Also going back to cellular antiox and then Brocco detox would be a really good one to consider. And then you might even consider using sunscreen on your hands prior to getting your nails done. But with that being said, you know, be mindful that they're going to dip your hands right. and soak them. So you might right. want to bring sunscreen in your purse right. and ask them to actually apply it after they've painted your nails before they do the setting. Yeah. As I was researching for this episode, of course, Instagram started advertising to me these gloves that you can wear. So apparently people have thought about this okay. because, <laughs> you know, it's a known concern and, and some people do go, I think every two weeks, you know, to get this done. Um, but the, there are gloves that you can also wear that are like, that have know, nail holes. Uh, they have nail holes. Okay. So like the finger hole gloves, I guess you would put them on, but then, you know, you have to wait till they're done the with the whole I thought the fake sandals were silly enough. Yeah. Now yeah. they really got, no, someone out there is just laughing at you ladies. Totally. Totally. <laughs> so I think our bottom line on this one would be like, yes, maybe a special event. You're getting married yeah. or you're going, going to on a your wedding honeymoon, or, and you're yeah. going to a wedding couple times a year. Absolutely. Um, but if this is a really frequent, like every two weeks, like clockwork, you're exposing yourself to all this. I would think about a different solution. Um, get your nails growing with some collagen and, you know, wean yourself of that habit. All right. Uh, let's talk about eyelash extensions. Yeah. So kind of in the same world of like beauty vanity, I've only ever worn false eyelashes and they weren't extensions for my wedding. Uh, I don't know about you if you've ever done them for like TV or other. The only time I've had them was like the drugstore version yes. yeah, of, yeah. of like the like, you know, caterpillar strip <laughs> with like the like glue. And this was in maybe like age 19 or something like that. And it was, oh no, maybe it, it, there was one time when I stood up for a friend's wedding and it like came in our kit and I was like, okay, peer pressure. I'll put them on right. with the rest How of the girls. How do I even do this? <laughs> right. But yeah. it, it did not look 
very good. Right. Um, and so the eyelash extensions are more like they're applying individual lashes. My whole thing with this and the same thing with nails is I don't have the freaking time to sit there for two hours and what in the world? You know, wait for paint to dry on my nails and not mess them up. I always bring my laptop if I'm doing just a pedicure. People that get them done um, say like, oh, I'm getting my lashes filled. Like, yeah, so that means maybe that like some parts stay and then some parts like fall out. Um, There used to be actually an eyelash extension place um, right next to our old office and people would go in for like two, three hour appointments because I could kind of hear through the wall. Uh Um, And I just don't think I I would have that kind of time. But um, just going into the process a little bit. So obviously we're applying something, you know, to our... Adhesive. An adhesive. um, We're going to need a glue. So we're applying an eyelash, whether it is... um, a you know manufactured product or it's made from sometimes they use mink hair um i've heard reports of using human hair well i had to put this in the notes just because i think it's really interesting um v lashy is a unique eyelash transplant surgery performed by dr ugraf this is a trademark technology not a, a human um, it might be a human, but it's being used like in the States and such. And it safely extracts pubic hair follicles as visible long-term grafts. Oh, and dear. the pubic hair follicles are implanted into the lash line. So you might be looking at people that have lovely lashes that are wearing pubes on their eyes. Where did they come from? <laughs> are they their own? I have so, pubes. <laughs> so many questions. And I don't think, to be fair, that's like what you're getting when you go in, you know, just to get eyelash Some extensions. Are, but <laughs> I don't think anybody asks. And I don't think we know for sure. Um, so the adhesives alone run the risks of allergic reaction um, to start with. So this includes redness, itching swelling of the eyelids and I for sure have heard this from clients we also had somebody on the um, chat that we have on our website asking about this particular issue of Mm -hmm. an allergic reaction um, to eyelashes that then made them hypersensitive to like all chemicals so that in and of itself is problematic Um, we're also looking at potential for eye infections right? right like this is a big you know entry point into our microbiome. And so I think about styes for sure, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, risk of bacterial infections, you're applying a foreign object Mm -hmm. at the end of the day. So bacterial and fungal infections, which just sounds awful around your eyes. Yeah. And and are they called chastelase uh, or something like that? I think so. Where there's going to be like a, um, uh, I don't know what to call it, but but basically a buildup of fluid Mm -hmm. from an infection from the eye. There you go. Situation on Mm -hmm. the eyelid, which is not fun. Mm -hmm. Um, We can see discharge from the eyes, more redness and swelling, you know, conjunctivitis or like pink eye, essentially, um, whether it's from the lash itself or a reaction to that adhesive. And then we can definitely see eye injuries, like if the uh, lashes themselves dislodge Mm -hmm. and or they weren't uh, applied correctly, they can have contact with your actual eyeball, which could damage or scratch the cornea or other outer parts of the eyes. And um, we can see even irritation to the conjunctiva, driving conjunctivitis or karyotitis, which would be um, damage to the cornea. So, you know, this can happen from the direct contact of the lashes themselves, like when closing your eyes, if placed too close, um, or again, dislodging and, and getting put into the eyeball, um, and then, or hypersensitivity to the substances of the adhesives or of the synthetic or natural lash compounds used themselves. Yeah. Um, and I just want to call out here again, I talked about formaldehyde with um, the nails, but we know that formaldehyde is a preservative, you know, used in embalming, um, mm-hmm. but um, it's a carcinogen and yes. an allergen. Um, so you can develop an allergy, especially if you're doing this. I don't know how often you have to get them filled, but I imagine it's at least once a month, if not you know, more frequently, um, and you're exposing yourself to this carcinogen. And I think people who do have the eyelash extensions are doing this, you know, over long periods of time too. They might have that, you know, for years. Um, and especially if your natural lashes are damaged, you may become reliant on extensions as well. And that's kind of therein lies the nails scenario, right? So you're going to be at some point, the weight of the eyelash extensions themselves and the stress on your natural lash line with the application removal adhesives 
is going to over time damage your natural lashes. And that's going to then lead to breakage, thinning, and feeling like dependency. Like you need, you know, that's what happens with the nails too. It's like, oh my gosh, my nails are so ugly between my shellac appointments. I need to make them more frequently. And I think that same thing happens with the lash extensions. Um, So again, another recommendation here would be our pure collagen to just enhance, just like we talked about strengthening the hair follicle on your head, you're going to see better eyelash health actually also with that Verisol compound in our pure collagen. And then you can, you know, ask the lash extension companies about less toxicity, but I kind of agree with you, Becky, similar to the nails where it's like, what do they really quote unquote know? Right. Um, just like organic spray tans. We didn't include that in this episode, but probably should have, but similar in that sense, right? It's like, well, it's an organic spray tan. It's like, okay, but like there's still a lot of concentrate of these minerals that are volatile and going into my respiratory tract, right. probably not a good thing. And the way that they're getting, I don't think there's an organic certifying body for spray yes. tanning for nail stuff. I think that's probably like the use of like natural in right. foods that we can call just about anything. Yes. Natural, yes. you know, it's an unfounded claim and nobody is, is regulating that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would be really mindful of Yes. Not, not so, going for the, just getting, you know, duped into the organic of all of this. Yes. And then you could though ask for a patch test, especially before, you know, committing to anything close to your eyes. So like have them put the adhesive and some of the lash material maybe on your back of your hand um, or another part of your body, maybe on your cheek or like lower jawline just to see for dermatitis, contact dermatitis or an allergic response before it's close to your eye. And then you don't have that conjunctivitis. Um, you know, swelling, pussing, mucus <laughs> to try to eradicate from your ocular space. Right. Imagine doing that before your wedding and ending up with that kind of Goodness a reaction. Well, I so, think that is why people yeah. test their makeup, right? right? They try to do like a makeup yeah, run a two trial. weeks prior. <laughs> yes. Yep. Um, but big skip. Um, I would say like the occasional use, like the upgraded version of the drugstore variety. Like again, if it's your wedding or like yeah. a big photo shoot or event, fine. Um, castor oil actually can be helpful, um, to get your eyelashes to grow. So you could do Ah. castor oil as an application. I know we talked about that with respect to, um, hair in our hair loss episode. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Um, but you can, I just don't have the diligence to do that, um, every night. Um, and it makes your eyes a little oily when you wake up in the morning, but you could try that if you're looking to like grow out your own natural lashes. Um, and then I think just wear, you know, a good clean mascara, like beauty counter. Uh huh. The mascara that I've been using, Booker's, it's like a teal color. I got it from the auction. It is a really natural brand. I'll put it in the show notes. Okay. I can't think of the cool. name of the brand. Yeah. And and when I say that I've been wearing, haha, it's kind of funny because every time I see um, Chelsea, who owns the market with me, if I'm ever wearing mascara, she goes, "What are you doing? You're wearing mascara." <laughs> Like, so it's like when I wear mascara, it's maybe three times a month. Um, and it's like, I have something big. We're, we're filming. It's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It means that yeah. I'm on camera, like not just, you know, Instagram, but it's like, right. We're filming for YouTube, um, uh, or something as a big, big event. Um, but this natural one that I will link, um, again, can't think of the name of the brand, but I'll put it in the show notes. Um, it does kind of like ball off. Um, it's, it's a little bit chunkier, but with that being said, it also, um, is pretty apparent. Like you can mm-hmm. see it. Creates so it does kind like of volume. thicken or volumize. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, and it is a non-toxic option as well. And then I also like the Ilia brand. Ilia, yep. That's my main like kind of one before I learned about this new one. Yep. Awesome. Okay. Um, so skip that and um, let's move on to last but not least. Um, and this could be one of the more invasive ones that like a I lot know. of our listeners are probably still doing. Um, earbuds and wearables. Um, yes. so you with the AirPods and the Apple watch and the Fitbit and the aura ring and all of the things I'm yes. talking to you. Okay. And if I'm going to identify one as the worst of these, it's likely going to be the wireless earbuds, which mm-hmm. are all too common. Um, the consideration of course, be that you are wearing them very close to your brain. So when we're concerned about cancer and EMF, especially in the world of like brain cancer, oxidative stress to the brain, advancing the aging process, these Apple AirPods or any form of wireless earbuds that use uh, Bluetooth type technology, these are going to emit high levels of EMF radiation. So they're actually putting out microwave type signals 
in direction to your head. You know, we've said, don't stand in front of your microwave when you're heating food. Well, you're literally wearing tiny microwaves when you're listening to podcasts or on a work call, et cetera. And, um, you know, we see between 2.4 and 2.8 gigahertz in frequency output. Um, it is known as non-ionizing radiation, um, but Bluetooth devices are going to give off other forms of EMF radiation. And we even know just from like topically um, holding these devices after being used for a long period of time that there's a heat energy sure. generating from them. Um, so when we're looking at EMF radiation safety guidelines, we see that all appliances and devices um, should really stand a large distance away from the body. Um, so this could be something like your Wi-Fi router. We want that at least 20 feet away. When we look at things like cell phones, we would recommend keeping conversations to less than 30 minutes a day, especially if the device is next to your head. We'll get into recommendations in a moment of things you can add and, and do. Um, but again, the concept with the earbuds and the strong consideration is that this is even closer than putting your cell phone screen up to your ear. And often people are wearing them nonstop they're not popping them in and right. off like taking a call they're wearing them even between calls um, and or they're going from a call to music or podcast sure. yeah, yeah. Um, and so this is constant EMF radiation literally blasting the head on a regular basis we just don't have enough long-standing research to look at the impact and the the influence on cancer risk and on neurological health Totally. And, and we have no idea, like the vaping, right? We don't know if 20, 30 years down the line, if we're going to see a huge influx of brain cancers, I would imagine so. Um, I think it's really problematic for sure. Um, let's maybe talk some of the just health concerns of EMF radiation exposure in general. I know we covered this a teensy weensy bit where you talked about your Wi-Fi kill switch and yeah. um, all of the things you've done in your household um, to make it, you know, wired instead of um, Wi-Fi everything mm -hmm. and whatnot. Yes. Yeah, so the big things that we see is mental health issues, actually, including depression and anxiety. Um, and I did talk about that a couple episodes back about like living in the city in Austin and being closer to 5G towers, mm -hmm. how I could feel a difference in my neurological system when sleeping and just a le less of a sense of deep peace that I feel out in a rural, peaceful environment. And I think that's dually the impact of seeing beauty in nature, but it's also the impact of less of that EMF in, in, for sure. Um, and um, I just want to kind of break down that a little bit further before I go into other physiological influences. You know, the, the big thing that I'm looking at is when we're seeing depression and anxiety and mental illness trending with EMF exposure, I think that this is because you're disrupting your autonomic nervous system. So when we talk about like putting your hand on your heart and feeling the vibration of your body, or we talk about how your autonomic nervous system, which is what harnesses that HPA axis, there's literally an electrical charge of our body. You know, we've talked about in a lot of episodes we did during pandemic about how human connection, like you can close your eyes in a room and sense that there's a human next to you without physiologically feeling them because you actually can sense their electronic magnetic field, you know, an EKG can actually read feet, feet, <laughs> multiple feet away from an individual. Um, and so there's that six feet or five to six feet debatable. And that was the irony of the six feet mm -hmm, of separation, right, right. um, for pandemic, but there is five to six feet away from a human an electrical charge. And so what happens, I question when we put an external gadget that has AI technology on our body, does that rob our own body's natural electronic magnetic field? I would argue absolutely yes. So you're basically taking your natural vibration and losing the sovereignty of your ability to harness with your thoughts, your heart, um, your breath work, and giving that up to AI and, and something synthetic, something technology. And not just that it's synthetic and that it's AI, but that it's on a, a more rapid epinephrine driving vibration than your nervous system should be at. And that's not even mentioning the constant stimulus and distraction from the present moment that you're getting from the data coming in, sure. right? So you're getting all of a sudden, you can't put your phone away if you're wearing an Apple watch, you're getting your, your right. blinking light of your right. text your messages, text all show up, your, your Instagram calls, comments, everything, yeah. Your, um, and so there's constantly stimulus of dopamine as well, which depletes and and that drives depression and anxiety. So I think that that honestly is the biggest thing 
that I would attribute. And then there's other physiological concerns. You want to go into some of those sure, that we've seen in sure. research? Yep. Um, and I also think just on that note, like surveillance too. Like, yeah. You're you know, never free. You're never free. You're giving and up you're, your sovereignty. You're wearing, you know, along with that, you're Trackable wearing this device. tracking device. My girlfriend used to call me out for that all the time. Um, pre, yeah, you, this was pre-2020. And I, I think I stopped wearing a Fitbit like before I even got pregnant with Noah. Um, you convinced me and so did my girlfriend Morgan. Um, <laughs> But it's a it's a tracking device essentially, and ha- who knows where that data is actually going? Like your Apple Health data yes. and whatnot. I don't know if I want the government to have that, right? Um, so or GPS you yes, all of the time, exactly, or exactly. listen to you. Like even if your phone is away, that thing is still on you, right? Um, and then you know beyond that, um, beyond the the sovereignty element, um, increased blood pressure we can see with EMF exposure. Um, we see changes to DNA structure in our cells, which could down the line lead to cancer. We see an increased risk of leukemia potentially. Um, changes to our skin protein structure and composition, which again I think cancer likely. Um, damage to brain cells and brain activity activity level, um, sleep disruption, disruption, lethargy, fatigue, and then fertility issues as potential effects of EMF. And even if you go and, um, look at Apple's user forums or you Google, I did this last night, Google, Google Apple watch causes, and you'll see what other people have either searched for or have noted on those forums, um, that they get a rash, which maybe that's just the, you know, topical dermatological Mm -hmm. element of what it's made of. Um, Apple watch causes cancer. Apple watch causes anxiety, causes burns, causes arm pain, wrist pain, tingling, which I've heard that one actually from clients for sure. I've experienced that clinically, yes. Um, Not personally again, but clinically I've had many people that have had tingling Mm -hmm. and um, specific to that arm and breast size of either lymphatic issues of like swelling in that said armpit of that arm that it's being worn on um, or right, neurological concerns or pain in that side of the body. So definitely, you know, you're exposing yourself to radiation. Um, and I think that that in itself makes it a big no, but I would argue that autonomic nervous system, it's so important that you can harness your HPA access and that you can harness your autonomic nervous system to work for you. So why would you let something rob your natural vibration? Yep. I think that's argument enough to, to leave those things by the door, but, um, let's talk kind of what we can do to either mitigate or, um, do instead. So I, I am always using my like wired headphones still. And when I go for a walk, so you need a converter, um, right? You, because you need a special converter now. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, or, or there are like certain headphones, um, that still fit. And that's why I stuck with like an iPhone 13 and didn't go beyond that. Um, cause that also has the ability to turn off the, um, 5g and all other, um, phones beyond that, I think have the built-in 5g mm-hmm. antenna. Um, but yeah, I'm, I look like a freak when I'm like walking at the park, the rare instance that I'm able to put headphones in. Cause usually I have a kid with me. I'm the only person with wired headphones still <laughs> that I see for sure. Brady's a yeah. wired headphone dude. I, I'm just, the only time I wear headphones is when I'm podcasting and they're wired, sure. nerdy, big sure. old headphones. Yep. <laughs> but yep. yeah, Brady at least listens to me there. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and then, um, also taking your calls on, on speaker and that drives Byron nuts in our mm-hmm. house, but I do it all the time. And he's like, the kids are napping, go outside. And I'm like, I'm not putting this thing by my head. Yes. <laughs> right. And if you must, um, we'll link on our Amazon store, the safe sleeve. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a couple other brands out there, but safe sleeve is what Becky and I have like converted our whole social circle. It's really funny. We all have safe sleeve cases. Um, we, we use Hara pads, um, under our laptops, um, and these block EMF and radiation. So if you must work on a laptop, you'd want to put your Hara pad down and then a pillow under you. If you're going to put that quote unquote on your lap, so you have like a multiple barrier, um, but you know, these types of radiation blocks, oh, I will say I can prove it. Um, cause I went to, I forget if I told you this, Becky, I went to the, um, science mill museum mm-hmm. out by Fredericksburg and there was a room that had like a, you know, a wave, an energy wave space. And you would, um, shoot a text to this number and it would show like a pattern of, of movement from your phone. And then you'd move your phone around and it like would dance with like color. And so mine was on, mine was in my um, safe sleeve and it didn't register. Okay. Which was pretty cool. Interesting. And then I had Brady put his on airplane mode and his was lighter. 
Okay. Um, but I was like, sweet, because I've never seen proof that it right. actually works. Right. And <laughs> yeah, I always question like, you know, going through security at the airport, like, is this thing actually like doing anything? Right. Um, and, and I had someone tell me that maybe it's not, but that's good to know. Yeah, okay. literally. Um, I, I, yeah, you got to go to the science mill and <laughs> test it out. Okay. Um, so speakerphone, otherwise putting something that's going to block radiation if you must use your phone closest to your ear. But I still think that's better than the, the ear pods, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, making sure that you're positioning your phone away from you as much as possible, even just for the addictive tendencies. Totally. Like, I'm so frustrated now that I've put Instagram back on my yeah. phone and I'm trying to like wake up my algorithms. I recognized yesterday Stella was in the kitchen and I found myself like in my bedroom scrolling Instagram and I'm like, what the hell? Your daughter's awake. Put your phone on the charger in your bedroom and go in the living room now. Um, And so I really try to, as like a a household rule or hygiene for Brady and myself, keep a charging station for your phone. And like during active family time and during times of just, you know, community, this is really, it's so sad when we watch like these, I don't know what generation they are, but when they're like out to lunch or on like dates and they're just scrolling on their their phones, it's so sad. Be present in the moment, but also when you're moving your phone away from you, that removes the EMF. So sleep with it. It doesn't have to be right next to you on your nightstand. Maybe put it in your vanity or your bathroom further away, the better for sure. Um, and, um, also using like in your car, like a speaker function, Mm -hmm. like Apple CarPlay would be something to consider for sure. Yep. Yep. And I know mine, you have to still plug into it. So it's not doing as much of the like Bluetoothy. Yeah. Cause I have heard stuff. that when like signals are yeah. weak, it, the radiation actually goes harder, goes harder. to try to yep. find. And so that's the same thing of maybe actually taking off of Wi Fi when you're in an area where your phone doesn't have Wi Fi. I've heard that as a recommendation mm-hmm. so that it can just use your um, like phone service um, yep. instead of searching for Wi Fi. Yep. Um, turning off the location services, um, which I do anyway, just again, dual hit maybe, for sovereignty maybe it's, and also EMF. Maybe it's paranoia, maybe whatever, but um, I turn that off on all apps whenever possible, except for obviously maps when I need them. Um, and then um, you also, um, there are ways with certain devices um, to um, put Disable. them into um, no Bluetooth or, or airplane mode as well. So I know mm-hmm. um, that Fitbit has certain devices that can be turned off in that way. I'm not sure about Apple Watch, but I imagine there's at least like an airplane kind of snooze mode to that. Um, I know that Aura Ring, which I mentioned, at least has low EMF um, detectable. And can go in some and like airplane into, mode. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. So um, if you are wearing that through your sleep, but, but do consider still that you're wearing a wearable device. Sure. sure. Yep. And, and, you know, maybe you don't wear it seven days a week. Maybe just check in on your sleep like one day a week. Maybe yeah. that's sufficient. Yep. Yep. And getting back to, again, like this idea about, are you letting a device tell you how your quality of sleep was? Like, do you really give so much of your sovereignty right. to that? Or do you want to just, just tap in with yourself in the feel? morning and say, I feel well rested yeah. or yeah. I slept like crap? Because I think that there is something to intuition within the body that's important to consider right. as well. Yep. And just giving that over to to the device it's true like then you stop trusting yourself if it says you slept at 100 and you woke up with your baby 57 times and that's not true i don't know (laughs) i don't know about that great so we'll put some of these um radiation blocking devices on my amazon store and link those in the show notes and and we talked about a couple different ways to kind of mitigate emf like i said i think this is a whole bucket of worms and we have a whole podcast coming down the line on emf we'll try to find a good guest so if y'all have any recommendations hit us up um, on our podcast page in that podcast box um, with a comment um, or just hit me up on Instagram at Allie Miller RD with a direct message of a recommendation for a guest. That's actually better because I'm not sure how good we are at checking the old website. And then um, I want to note as far as nutrient support for EMF, Honestly, the biggest thing you can do is support by antioxidants. So Mm -hmm. we're kind of back in that same, all toxic habits essentially need detox. And so you need to quarterly do your 10 day detox and all toxic habits need high antioxidants. So we're talking about cellular antiox. We're talking about that bio C plus, and we're talking about Brocco detox and specific to sulforaphane, definitely in the EMF world, there's some really um, interesting data that we're seeing of protective elements of the broccoli sprout. And so that would be an added hit for the EMF argument there in the Brocco detox. So those would be kind of the three superstars in the supplement world, I guess four, if we're including our detox packs in there. 
And then high antioxidants in the diet, yes. obviously. Herbs, seasoning, herbs, seasoning, spices. Spices, produce mm-hmm. of various colors. Um, and I think for most of these things, nature is also a great antidote, right? Like getting out more. in nature, putting your phone away, going for a hike and not bringing it with you because you don't need a picture of yourself and proof that you were there, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and Ugh. embracing, you know, natural beauty in terms of the nails and the eyelashes and just kind of rolling with what you got. Thinking just like what we say with food of, you know, you want to trust not the government telling you what's generally recognized as safe. You want to trust what's safe to consume based on the test of generations of viability. Same thing as far as all of these toxic habits. How many hundreds of years have these been done to prove that these are safe? So something to think about. Get your hands back in the dirt and enjoy your time with real community in 3D. Thank you for listening to the Naturally Nourished podcast. Visit our blog at AllieMillerRD.com for recipes, wellness tips, and food as medicine meal plans. Connect with Allie and Becky at AllieMillerRD on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until next time, stay nourished and be well.